Hi, I'm Cahal Boland. I want to tell you a story about an event that happened in Ballybockel, here in Fingal, North County, Dublin. Just coming to the end of the War of Independence, the men in Fingal became particularly active. There had been a number of atrocities carried out by the Black and Tans, the sack of Balbriggan last October, six months before this event. Shootings in the villages where men were taken out and murdered in front of their families. So the men in Fingal had set up a camp at Moortown and they carried out many raids on RAC patrols, trying to engage with the Black and Tans, taking pot shots and on occasions killing Tan officers. This story is about the 18th of April, a Monday. The men had word that a payroll truck for the RIC was going to pass through their area and they had set up roadblocks ready to intercept and to attack the vehicle. They hung around for hours. Word then came that the RIC patrol had taken another route. So they packed up and headed back towards Moortown, but came through Ballybottle. Many of the men went down to Moortown. Some broke away and went to visit their homes. Some actually went and worked for farmers during the day. Others hung around the village. Some worked in the village. But life went on within the village. The postmistress dealing with the locals. <laughs> the farmer out doing his rounds. The postman delivering post. Went over to Old Town, yes, they had to go to Old Town. So there is going to be trouble. There is definitely going and to be trouble. And this has been all been planned. This has been for planned for weeks, I believe. And but I knows? don't know. I don't know the full story. So I'm waiting on them to come back to get the full information. But just pray that nothing happens. Pray that nothing happens. Like you know. Pray. Did that you hear anything yourself? No, I didn't. No, say anything, no, I didn't hear it. No, full story. I knew there was something yeah. funny about this. There's definitely something going on. on. I could see definitely it. Definitely something going it. on. Lucky Donnelly was the blacksmith, who was a bit of a character, provided entertainment for them. And then, as the day progressed, the pub opened. Some of the men went in for the odd pint. Others played pitch and toss. Others just amused themselves. At about six o'clock, Lucky Donnelly, the blacksmith, headed down to the pub to get a pint to clear his throat. He met Jack Hagen and Peter White. Peter White was the captain of the company Inside and Swords, although he lived down the road only a couple of miles. Jack Hagen was also a Ballybuckle man, lives at the Grange up to the show Lane. They chatted about the day what had happened, what hadn't happened, what might happen. And also at the same time, James Wilson was sitting on the bank. He was known as the Red Fellow, head of red hair. But he was passing time waiting for the girlfriend to turn up. She was Bridget Delaney and she worked in the doctor's house in Old Town. And she'd first come across Wilson when the doctor told her to cook breakfast for some of the lads. And the red fellow was there and they clicked. She perhaps with notions of wedding ring, God knows what the red fellow was thinking. Then he heard a noise. Yeah, 
It was a motor coming from the null direction. That meant more than likely that it was the RIC in the Tans. Oh, he's concerned for Bridget. And he told her to get along home. Go away. Don't be seen. Don't be about. There could be trouble. And he hurried then into the pub, where he found the three guys. Donnelly, Hagen and White. He told them what he thought was going to happen, that for whatever reason, the RIC were coming into the village. The lads were concerned. What did it mean? Were the houses going to be raided? They had guns with them? That would mean they'd be arrested. Anyway, they looked out the window and indeed it was a tan vehicle. Three RIC men and a tan driver. And out got Stephen Kirwan, sergeant, well known to them. He'd been stationed above in Garristown from 1911 to 1919 and then was transferred into Balbriggan. He'd been the census enumerator in 1911. So he'd knocked on all their doors. He knew them. And they knew him. He headed for the pub. But went in the haggard gate. The back entrance to the pub. The family entrance. Although it was used by those who wanted to be a little bit discreet about going into the pub. Hello, Eddie? So the lads decided they'd go out and see what was happening. Could they manage to slip away? They came out and a slagging match between the RIC guys, who equally had been in the area for some time in Balbriggan. Wilson, Donnelly and Hagen, all enthusiastically engaged with the RIC men. And during that, young Eddie O'Connor and another lad drove cattle up the road, heading for the Haggard. So the three lads decided to give them a hand, opened the gate for them, assisted them getting the cattle in, closed the gate behind them. The three lads were on the far side of the gate to the RIC. They slipped the bolt, while Jack Hagen then carried on the slagging with the RIC guys, distracting them to what was going on. Hagen goes back into the pub. Now we have a situation that the three IRA men are inside in the yard of the Haggard. Sergeant Kieran comes to the back door to leave. He opens the ah, door and he's confronted again. by the three guys. What sort of an evening is it for you? And then suddenly he realises there's something wrong.
Is he okay? Sergeant Kirwan, while having been hit, managed to get five shots away from his service revolver, hitting one of the IRA party. Peter White made his escape independently from the scene. When he came to the stream, he took his hand away and he looked he saw the blood and he realized that he was very seriously injured. This was not a minor nick. This was a shot that had gone right through into his guts. He knew he was in serious difficulties. Would he even make the village? He struggled on. He stumbled. But he got to the village. He headed towards the post office. He knew Mrs. McKay would be there. Sergeant Kirwan's revolver fell from his pocket. He fell to the ground short of the door. People came from all corners of the village. They'd heard the shots and now heard the screaming. They all were shocked. They tried to be of assistance to Peter White. They knew there was little they could do. Mrs. McCabe told the postman to go and get Crinigan above in Rollstown and tell him what's happened that Peter White is very seriously injured and they need to do something because she was sure the Tans would be back. At the post office, one of the passers-by happened to be a doctor who stopped and tried to give assistance to Peter White. Grinnigan had lost a brother in the Battle of Ashburn. He was now a senior figure in the IRA.
The postman reached Kernigan, told Kernigan what had happened, and told him of the need for the IRA company to be alert to try and do something for Peter White. Kernigan set off back towards Ballybuckle with him. And as they approached, he wasn't prepared to go into the village, not knowing who was there or what was actually happening. A second doctor had arrived on the scene. Peter White kept insisting that his burden shouldn't be told how badly injured he was. Peter White had been a bit of a character around the place. There are stories told of him robbing women's knickers and hanging them as bunting across the street of the village. The police would say that he was a pickpocket, a vagabond, a trespasser, snaring rabbits. He was suspect in more than one attempt to assassinate TANS and IRIC officers. Now he lay on the ground. He was dying. And then Father Delaney arrived, said prayers, and then they lifted Peter White into the parlour and tried to make him comfortable. And Father Delaney gave him the last rites. The postman headed back towards the post office. He came across a group of local people who were exchanging information, speculating as to what had happened. And amongst the, that crowd was Bridget Delaney, the Red Fellows' girlfriend. She didn't know what had happened to poor James. Was he the victim? Nobody knew. They just knew somebody was down. The postman said he was heading back anyway to the post office. He couldn't be standing there talking to him. And as he did so, Bridget decided to go and find out for herself. The postman gets back to the village. Peter White is now inside the parlour. He goes in to find out what's happening, followed by Bridget Delaney. Crinigan had now been joined by Thomas Murphy and Jack Shields. Thomas Murphy was a man from the Moortown camp, not a Fingal man, a man who had been sent there to hide effectively because he was in hot water in wherever he originated from. Jack Shields was a senior member of the Fingal battalion. The three of them discussed and considered what was the best course of action. They all agreed that irrespective of the cost to them, they had to get Peter White into Dublin, into a hospital. The only way of getting him there was by using a car. And the only car in the area was owned by Mr. Cunningham. Oh my God, oh, that's desperate. They asked for the car, and Mr. Cunahan said he had offered the car to them earlier in the day, but it had been refused, and that they were wasting their time in any event, and the towns would be on them before they knew what had happened to them, and that their best course of action was to make themselves scarce, and to let the towns worry about getting Peter White into hospital. I will keep repeat my chat. You go into the fields. Go. I will 
take your advice, so I am uh, bravo, Mr. Coonan. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You have a great day. They needed now to save themselves, to cut out into the countryside, get away. But Jack Shields said he was only in his short sleeves and that he wanted to get a jacket from his house if they were going to spend the night in the fields. So they made their way to his home to find it locked. He lived there with his mother, as it happened. She was now down in the village, assisting and helping nurse Peter White. Whilst they were trying to force their way into the house, they heard loud raps on the front door with calls from the towns to open up. Now the three made their way from the premises and tried to make good their escape, but the towns spotted them and followed them. The postman comes out of the post office, distraught. Peter White, a fellow he knew well, was lying there with blood pumping out of him. The doctor shaking their heads. He was as good as dead. Then Bridget Delaney came out of the post office, greatly relieved that it wasn't her man who'd been hit. Shield said he would make a decoy for them and give them a chance to get away. But they first had to provide cover for him to let him get a head start in the towns. But after a time, the towns realized they'd been duped, that Shields was getting away. And Shields in a white shirt in an open countryside was an easier target than people dug in in a ditch. Shields ducked and dived and he stayed in the ditch, hiding from them, lying into the sides letting the brambles obscure them. And after a time, he heard the voice of a South African officer telling them there was no point now looking for the Shinner. They were wasting too much time. There was things to be done in the village that they'd have more productive use of their time by going and sorting out the publican. So the tans pulled away. When they did, she slipped away and worked his way back to Moortown. So Crinigan and Murphy made their way, calling on a safe house, out of breath, needing a rest, giving a glass of water. They equally told him that Shields was in trouble being chased by the Tans and that he might get the word back up to Pepper in Moortown camp. Now the Tans, exasperated, frustrated and angry, head back into the village, determined to get those responsible and make them pay. The scene of the shooting had been O'Connor's, so they decided they'd go and talk to Eddie O'Connor the publican. He was the guy who would give them the names and who had been in his pub and who had been drinking there and what they said and what they intended to do. Check that door. 
check that door. Get these men out. You two, you two, you two. In, let's go. In, in. Get that man out. Get him out. Is this your pub, Mr. O'Connor? It is. Do you have information for me? I don't have any information. Do you know something that I need? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Listen, you Irish scum. I need information. Talk! I can't, I can't talk. talk! I don't know! Talk! 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 I will not! I can't talk! talk. talk. I don't! I can't! I will shoot you! You know what this is! You know what this is! This place will burn and you will die. You can't Do you know what this is? Come on in, come on in. Get down. I don't have it. Where's the information? This will burn. Let me out. Talk. 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 McKinney. Yes, sir. Go on, McKinney. Get him. Hello, McKinney. You're a nice little tiger, aren't you? I need information, and that man is going to get it. And if he doesn't get it, this place will burn. And so I don't have information. Ah, uh, Paddy. My old friend, Paddy. You want to be a right pain in the arse, aren't you? You heard the officer. He wants answers. So I'm going to get Leave her alone! 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 Kill you, I'm gonna kill you quick! No! I'm gonna kill you like nobody's ever died before in Sally Buffalo, you know? And then said they'd burn his pub down. And him along with it. Get the paraffin, boys! Where's your mercy? Get him. No. I wanna know who did it! No, you can't! I wanna you can't. know! You can't! Answer the question! Cover him in paraffin, boys! Cover him in paraffin! No. Cover him! Now, Paddy. Now, Paddy. You thought this gun was a problem, did you? See that? Gun's gone. Now you've got a different problem, Paddy. And the issue you've got now is this. Paddy. No. All right, you leave me no bloody choice, you stupid thing and son of a bitch. Light it up, lads. Light it up. It's gonna get better. It's gonna get better. Who made it? Light it up! Yes, sir! Yeah, light it. No, you can't! Light it up, lads! Light it up! Burn it! You're not gonna talk, Paddy! This place will burn! You talk, alright, you? If I don't get answers out of you, Paddy, and I'll make you wish you were never born! You can't! You can't! Son of a thing, you bitch! A good man died, and you know who killed him! You have no mercy! He was a dollar of mercy! Couldn't care less! No! no. Burn it! Shut her up! No! Shut her up! You, what the bloody hell's going on here? Explain yourself. This man has information that I require. And do you really think this is the way to go about it? I do, sir. This is disgraceful. Get yourself. I have back. this under control. No, you do not. This is not acceptable, baby. Do you hear me? 
You may get yourself back to the barracks now or you'll be under court martial. This instant. Now. Now? Yeah. If you say I'm, so. I'm an officer. Let's go, lads. Let's go. So, O'Connor, the publican was saved, as was his pub, by good fortune, as that man appeared on the scene. So the following morning, the 19th, Peter White was taken by ambulance from Ballybochel to the same hospital that Sergeant Stephen Kirwan had been brought to the day before. Both of them fighting for their lives now, although I think all realised it was only a matter of time till death arrived to take them finally away. And so it was that at 7.20 in the evening, Peter White passed away and at 10.30 the same evening, Sergeant Kirwan died. The following day, the 20th, the body of Peter White was released to the family. A small wake was held where his comrades came and said goodbye. All of the community, not just in Ballybottom, but the surrounding area and villages, all wanted to be part of the final journey of this young man whom they all knew. There were men in the crowd who travelled out from Dublin. IRA men. What a haul the towns would have had had they arrested the mourners. But the Tans had other ideas. They restricted the funeral to family members only and a few close associates. Right, that's only family only. Family only. 
It was a simple funeral. They were simple people. Nothing flash, nothing elaborate. Peter White was buried in the old graveyard in Ballybacco. So Sergeant Stephen Kirwan was buried on the 21st of April in Last Nevin Cemetery. And two days later, more fatalities for the Tans at Lochran. A district inspector injured. An ordinary member of the Tans killed. But they were killed by the British Army. They just brought death wherever they went. But that's another story, another day.
Hi, I'm Anne Goff, and I am the granddaughter of the late Jack Shields. But when they got to the back of the window, they heard this immersive banging on the door. As it turned out, the Tans were trying to get into the house, so they decided the best thing to do was to run. They, they left, and then that's when my granddad was able to get out and ended up, I think it took him about a day or two, but he ended up going over to Old Town across the fields. Jack Shields at the same time was more of a target because he didn't have a coat, so they could actually see him a lot clearer. They put straw around the base of the pub and they were going to shoot him. He was a very well liked and you know, an affable class of a man. He, he was the census enumerator from around here. And I would imagine that he was probably familiar with a lot of the people who were swept up in the events that led to his death on that day. Now you've done six hard months in Kilmainham Jail and after releasing, being released from Kilmainham Jail he came outside and he kissed the girl and he said to Tans and he came home and I believe he came here for a few drinks after that, my father was telling me. And then during through the research of the telling of the story of who Peter White was, the local man shot in O'Connor's pub, he's done a bit of research on finding out who he was. Inside a week, my grandfather's hair had turned from black to white, and he died in November of the same year from the shock of what happened in the pub.